Um, we're in the middle of a series. This is actually week two of a series called Got Him. Got Him. And uh, what, what Got Him looks like, for, for those of you that were here last week, you guys saw, we go into some bedrooms. We go cruising around to some of you guys' houses. We talk with your parents. We get permission. And we start just checking things out. And uh, we capture some video. We put a video together. We put it on the big screen for all you, your friends to see. And so tonight, we're going to show you Got Him. Part two. Let's see it. Got him. next that's the real question who's next but what here's what we do with that we we take a video like that we take a look around and then I've said this for years as we've done a series just like this every year we've uh, we've talked about some things like your your bedroom says some things about you like what you hang on the walls what you do when your free time it's kind of your little sanctuary it's your place to get away and so as we look at the scripture tonight I want to just take a concept or take a theme and, and, and run with that. And so that's what we do. But I'd like to pray. Will you pray with me? 
Heavenly Father, thanks. Thanks for your presence. Thanks for your help. Thank you for your word. God, I thank you that it accomplishes what you sent it to do. Lord, I pray that as we look at a story of a life in the Bible tonight, God, that we'd get a picture of your heart and your desire for our lives. Lord, let your word change us. We say yes, have your way. Holy Spirit, do what you do best. Change lives, in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. 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 So what, what I want to talk about tonight is I want to talk about your heart from the perspective of, is everything all right in there? You know, I, I've asked this question one other time, I think, that I recall, but you guys know how to take your pulse. If, you, if I said, hey, take your pulse right now, would you know how to do that? Yeah. You could do it like this on your, on your wrist. You could do it like this, right? And when you take your pulse, what does that tell you? You're alive, hopefully. If it, there's any bump in there at all, if there's any thump, anything moving, any, any blood flowing, you're going you're gonna to sense it. You're going to feel it. But it'll tell you how, how worked up you are, maybe how anxious you are, maybe how fatigued you are. Any of y'all run the 5K this past weekend? Come on, some of, some of y'all, you're running the 5K and your heart was like through the roof and you're like, dun, 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 dun. if you had taken your pulse, it would have been like 200. I think Neil Magala was like 206. He was wearing a heart rate monitor, 206 beats per minute. That is not safe, not safe one bit. But he was just thumping, going for it. But when we take our, our pulse, I want to ask you not just to take your pulse this way, but actually let's take a look at our hearts tonight. And just as we look into a bedroom and we see a picture, you know, last week we looked into one, this week we look into one. We've got several others that we've already looked into and, and that we're going to put on display in over the next few weeks. But if we take the concept of what we, what we say, what we saw in that one of, you know, kind of a messy bedroom. You think of your heart and you think of your life and you go, well, what if my life is a bit of a mess? What if I don't have it all together? Does God only love me if I have it all together? Does God only care about me if I have it all together? Or does he actually get in my mess with me? And I believe God wants to get in your mess with you, that you don't have to have it all together, but we have to actually take an assessment of where we're at before we can ever accomplish or get anywhere different. If you don't know where you're at, you can't get where you're trying to go. And our picture of where we're at today, hopefully you can assess that and you go, you know what, I got a little bit of a mess going on. Some of you guys, your, your home life, mom, dad, maybe your school, your academics, maybe your relationships are just maybe a mess. Well, there's, there's a story in the Bible that I want to look at. I, I think God actually is kind of into a messy life. That God actually looks at people and goes, that is a mess, but I want to get in there and I want to do something radical in the middle of it. And there's a story of a guy named David in the Bible. David, which we, we know to eventually be the king, King David. He, um, he grew up in a family where he wasn't like, you know, the first one chosen. He wasn't like the, you know, the, good, the best looking guy or the most talented or the most this or most that. There was a time where the prophet actually came um, to this house where God had sent him and said, hey, the next king is going to be of, of this household, Jesse's household. And he went down the line and none of, none of the guys really fit what, what he, the prophet felt like God was, um, was saying about who was going to be king. And he, so he says to the dad, he says, hey, is there another son? There's got to be one somewhere. Is there another one? Oh, yeah, that one. He's out tending the sheep. He's out, he's out as a shepherd boy, out doing life. And he actually ends up getting kind of told that he's going to be king at a very young age, but yet he doesn't become the king overnight. And it takes some time. And in that, in that process of time, all sorts of crazy chaos goes on in his life where the actual, the King Saul, the guy who's in charge at the time, actually finds out that David's going to be the man. David actually kills Goliath. He fights this like, you know, nine foot six beast of a man, Goliath with a slingshot. You guys have probably heard that story, David and Goliath. And, you know, throughout this process, then the king starts chasing him because, you know, David's killed his, you know, Saul has killed his thousands, the Bible says, and or somebody says in the, in the Bible, and that David's killed his ten thousands, which isn't true. But the, all this strife and all this mess starts going after, going after David, and literally trying to like you know kill him, throw spears at him, and just crazy stuffs going on. And then there comes another story, like later on, where David actually becomes the king. He actually is the man. He's in charge of the the whole area. And I want to pick this story up in Second Samuel chapter eleven. We're going to read a little bit about. This guy, David, who the Bible calls this guy, David, a man after God's own heart, okay? This is what 
the picture is of David, a God after, or a man after God's own heart. And this is a story that happened in his life that I want to walk through. It says this, in the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. Next verse. It says, late one afternoon after his midday rest. Anybody like a nap? Anybody nap? You like a nap? I like me a little nap. I don't get midday naps very often, but I like a nap. Naps are good. David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. As he looked over, out over the city, he, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. It's going to get a little spicy here in a second. <laughs> he, sent, he sent someone to find out who she was. He checks out some lady over there. Hey, somebody should go over there. As he was told, she is Bathsheba. Somebody say Bathsheba. Bathsheba. The daughter of Iliam and the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. Next verse. Then David sent messengers to get her. Hi, I want that girl over there. Bring her over here. This is the king. And when she came to the palace, he slept with her. Here's where it gets a little spicy. She had just completed the purification rites after her menstrual period. Ugh. It's even in the Bible. It's even in the Bible. Then she returned home. Next verse. This is real life. This, this is the Bible. This is real stuff. It says, later when Bathsheba discovered that she was pregnant, she said to David, or she sent to David saying, I'm pregnant. Next verse. Then David sent word to Joab, send, send me Uriah the Hittite. This is, this is her husband. He's saying, hey, give me her husband. He got her pregnant and saying, hey, bring the husband in. So Joab sent him to David. Next verse. When Uriah arrived, David asked him how Joab the arm, and the army were getting along and how the war was progressing. Keep going. We're going to keep trucking. It says, then he told Uriah, go, go on home and relax. David even sent a gift to Uriah after he had left the palace. But Uriah didn't go home. He slept that night at the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. When David heard that Uriah had, gone, had not gone home, he summoned him and asked, what's the matter? Why didn't you go home last night after being away for so long? Uriah replied, the ark and the armies of Israel and Judah are living in tents, and Joab and my master's men are camping in the open fields. How could I go home to wine and dine and sleep with my wife? I swear that I would not, never do such a thing. Listen. Now the last verse, it says, when, well, stay here today, David told him, and tomorrow you'll return to the army. So Uriah stayed in Jerusalem, whoa, stayed in Jerusalem that day and the next. And here's the rest of the story. David, sleep, I'm going to summarize it. David sleeps with this girl. She becomes pregnant. He calls for the husband. The husband comes in. Husband doesn't even go home to see his wife so that they couldn't mix this up and think that, oh, that baby is his baby. None of that was going on. Couldn't have ever occurred. So he says, hey, I'm going to send you back out to battle. You know what he does? He sends him out to the battle and he puts him in the front lines so that he gets killed. This is the king. This is the man after God's own heart, the Bible calls this guy, David, right? He has a mess going on. He gets somebody pregnant and sends her husband to the front lines to get killed. So, he, so now he's not only adulterer, but now he's going to be murderer as well. He's going to get this dude killed on his watch. And when all this goes down... After Uriah dies, the husband dies, and all this goes down, there's some verses in, in a psalm, Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is David's heart, and he's crying out. Psalm 51, verse 3, actually. Could you put up verse 3 for me first? I'm looking. I'm looking. We're racing. Who's going to get there first? Psalm 51, 3. There it is. It says, I know how bad I've been. My sins are starting are staring me down. This is what, this is what um, David's assessment is of the situation, of his heart. Just like I was telling you about taking your pulse, he's taking a pulse of his heart, not his literal heartbeat, but his condition of his heart. And he says, I know how bad I've been. My sins are staring me down. He knows that he's made a mess of his life. He's made a mess of this woman's life and this child's life. And this man who got killed now is life. And all of this stuff is just spinning out of control. And David stops and goes, the mess is staring me down. And maybe some of you guys have felt this way before. You felt like maybe it's not to this radical extreme, but maybe it's been like, man, I'm blowing it and I know I'm blowing it and I don't know what to do. And my life's a mess. What do I do? And here's what verse six says. Jump down to verse six. It says, but you, and he's talking to God, and he says, but you desire honesty from the womb. Teach me wisdom, teaching me wisdom, even there. Here's the whole message for tonight is this. That though your life might be a mess, though you might be caught up in the just dirtiest, raunchiest sin you could think of or imagine, God's saying, hey, I just want you to be honest with me. 
would you just be still and be honest with me? Would you expose your heart? Would you expose the condition of your heart to me? Would you be bold enough to approach God, even in the middle of your mess, and go, God, look at this mess in my life. Look at where I'm at. Now, did God not know where David was? He absolutely knew where he was. He absolutely knew the conditions of his heart. But you know what God, God desires? What's it say here? But you desire what? Honesty. God wants honesty. God wants an intentional, you coming to him and going, I'm, I'm a mess, God. I'm a mess. And in that place of humility of going, God, help. I'm, this is out of control. I can't get out of this myself. Help me. You know what God does? The Bible says that when you draw near to God, he draws near to you. He says that when you step in and when you say, hey, God, look at this. Would you help me here? He's quick to respond. Look what Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, verse 22 and 23 says. It says, let us draw near with a true heart. Or another version says, a sincere heart. In full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Here's what happens. When you draw near to God with a sincere heart. When you say, hey, here I am. Here's my heart. God, look, I'm coming to you real and honest. Like, I'm not hiding anything. I'm not being shady. You know what? You could play games all night long. You could like put on whatever appearance of everything's good forever, all the time. You could walk through life at school. Man, you could go to every, every Bible study. You could be up here leading worship and on the inside be an absolute train wreck. But you know what God wants? He wants a sincere heart. And he says, hey, just come to me. He says, come on, come, come, come. Bring your true heart knowing full well knowing full well that i'm going to wash that i'm going to clean that i'm going to make you whole that i'm going to make you right but if you want to sit and you want to play games you know what jesus actually called out the pharisees this uh, in, in his time when jesus was walking the earth there were these religious folks who thought they had it all together and they knew all the rituals they knew all the stuff and you know what jesus said jesus said you're just a bunch of whitewashed tombs what he was saying is that you've got it all cleaned up and polished on the outside, but you're a mess and empty on the inside. And you know what he desired? Not religion. He didn't desire all this rote ritual. You know what he wants? He wants relationship. That's why he says, hey, come with a true heart. Come with a sincere heart. Hey, come, come on, come on. Let's, let's do life together. Even in your mess, he says, come on, let's do life together. You know, the outward appearance, we work hard on that. You guys, you guys want to look good, you get certain clothes, you wear certain things, there's trends, there's this, there's that. And you work hard on the outward appearance. But you know what, if we would spend a little bit of time on the inward man, the thing on the inside, our heart, and the condition of our heart, you know what, the outside will take care of itself. God wants a sincere heart. You know, the, the reason that, that the Bible could talk about David as being a man after his own heart is not because of what he did with Bathsheba, not because of what he did in all the other situations where he fell, but because of the way he got up and sincerely went to God. And he, there's another verse in the, in the Bible that says that David's saying, hey, search me and know me. If there's any wicked way in me, create me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. He went boldly to God and was like, God, help me fix this problem. He knew where the answers came from. He knew the answer to every, every question was I got to go to God. His way is better than my way. And me trying to do it on myself, I've created a mess for myself. But sometimes we're comfortable in our mess. Anybody like a good messy, messy room? Come on, messy roomers. There's some of y'all. Come on, be free. It's cool. It's cool. Messy is cool. If I had my way, my room would be a mess too. But my wife, like my wife, I call my wife the wash Nazi. If I like take a sock off, whoosh, off the floor in like no time. If I drink, no joke, I drink a water out of a cup and I'm like, I set it down, it's done, boom, it's gone. I'm like, where'd my cup go? Wash Nazi got it. She is like, tsh, tsh. you go over to my office right now, earlier today in my office I had stuff all over the floor and just like crazy stuff. I'm just like, I'd rather just deal with what's in front of me and just throw this, as long as it's not right in front of me, I'm good. Over here, no problem. Come on, anybody else messy like me? Come on. Come on, yeah, Caitlin, come on, thanks. Yeah, Caitlin, come on. Listen, it's okay, but you know what? If we think we're going to hide our mess, you know what? Our mess gets exposed. I don't care how good you think you could put it all together. And you know what? Somebody's going to get on the inside of your car eventually and see your junk everywhere. Somebody told me this once before. Somebody said, hey, you want to see, see how put together somebody is? Look in their car. 
I actually never even seen the inside of her car. I've just heard her talk about her car. But you know what? We run through life. We're going, we're going, we're going. You know what? God's saying, hey, slow down a minute. Let me, let me get in there. I know the condition of your heart, but do you? Do you know the condition of your heart? Have you been honest and gone, hey, God, I got some stuff to work on. Let's work on it together. You know, God's not seeking perfection. He's not looking for perfection. You know, God's in the habit of perfecting people, not expecting people to be perfect. He's working on people. He's working things out in your life. He wants to work it out with you. He's not saying, hey, only perfect people can come to church. It's not the case. Not the case. That's why we're always going, come on, come to church. Hey, get in church. This morning I was at Jefferson Middle School. Some of y'all middle schoolers at Jefferson. It was cool. I got to hang out with you guys at FCA. And you know what? I, every time I speak, when I go out to a school, every time I speak, you know what I try to tell people? Do go to a good church. Don't, you don't have to come to this church, but go to a great church. Get involved in a local church. Man, there's a you church for you. And you guys are here. You get it. But you know what? We need to have a place where we can be real with God. We can get into an environment where we can say, here I am, God, in my mess. Now, should we stay in our mess? Would it have been good for David to just stay in the mess? No. No. The best place you could do is recognize you're in a mess and go, keep your, keep your head up, your chin up, and look to the hills where your help comes from, is what Scripture says. Keep your head up. Our help comes from the Lord. We need to be in a place where we say, you know what, I'm not content being in a mess. I want to get out of my mess, and I need you to help me, God. Will you help me? This is a little bit more pointed question, but I'm going to ask it, and I'm going to let you just kind of simmer on it for a second. Is there an area of your life, students, even leaders, is there an area of your life that you wouldn't want it to get exposed tonight? And you're like, whoa, no, not that. That's probably something that you ought to open up and go, here, God. Because if you're, if you're ashamed or you're afraid that somebody's going to find something out, you know what? You probably ought to go, God, here it is. Here's where I'm at. And I need help right where I'm at. You know, there was a time I was growing up. I grew up in a home where my dad had been an alcoholic. I, I grew up till the age of like nine years old. My dad was like drinking, just out of control drinking. And uh, my dad actually went to a rehab facility to, to get the alcohol thing dealt with. He was there for 30 days. And uh, we had to sit and we had to come as, as children. We had to come. We had to sit in this like counseling, this group counseling thing. And, um, and I remember it like it was yesterday. Like it was pretty traumatic. It was kind of like a, it was just an ugly, it just wasn't fun. And um, I grew up from that point and from nine years old, knowing full well that alcohol was not going to be in my house. My mom didn't drink. My dad had been out of control. He went to a rehab facility and he was never going to drink again. And my dad said this to me, you better never come home drunk or you might as well pack up your stuff and leave. But me in my, I think I can do this and I think I can manage my life and nobody will ever know. As a freshman in college, I would go out and I would party and I would drink and I would get out of control illegally. I'd come home and the, probably the bottom end of my scale ever, um, or probably one of the worst days of my, you know, life, was on Christmas night one time, I went out and partied with some of my friends. And I thought it'd be cool. And it's like Christmas night, it'd be fun. Like, hey, let's hang out. And I'd been taking some anti-inflammatories because I was a baseball player and I was having some elbow trouble. And so I was taking some medicine. But then I went out and I drank while I was taking medicine. And um, bad things happen when you mix alcohol and you mix medication. That should never happen. The alcohol is a mess and the medication is a mess. And when you wrap, wrap those two together, bad things happen. Well, I drank a lot. I thought I could manage all this whole thing. And I'm riding home with my friends down the freeway, puking out the window. Pretty awesome moment. Really, it wasn't. It was pretty embarrassing and pretty awful. That wasn't the end of it, though. I get home. I walk in. My parents are asleep. It's super late. I get home. I go to sleep. And I wake up. The day after Christmas, how many of y'all the day after Christmas ever go shopping, like take stuff back? Any of y'all ever do this? Come on, some of y'all have done this before, right? The day after Christmas, you go to the mall because it's great sales or whatever. Some of y'all don't want to like acknowledge you did that, but it's okay. You take gifts back and you exchange them, whatever. Well, my sister comes in to wake me up the day after Christmas and she's like, ah, you threw up all over yourself. Oh my gosh. And I was like, what do you mean? No, 
No, I just slobbered. I just like slobbered a little bit. Any of y'all ever slobber when you sleep? Come on. You could be honest, right? Some of y'all do that. I was like, no, no, it's just slobber. And there was just puke all over my room. Why am I telling you this story? Here's why. I thought I could manage my little alcohol little thing. I thought, no, but never know. Well, you know what my room smelled like? You could only imagine. Barf. Alcohol. Barf. And oh, it's just a little slobber on my face. I'm sure you guys have never, ever, on any level, deceived someone or tried to deceive someone. You know what the reality is? Every one of your lies will get exposed. The thing, the Bible says, the things you do in the, in the hidden will be brought to the light. What you do in the dark will be brought to the light. I thought I could manage it. It wasn't long after that I gave my life to the Lord. And man, I haven't, I mean, I haven't drank a sip of alcohol since 1998 in, you know, almost 20 years. Yeah, that's good. That's good stuff, right? My family and only Jesus. Yeah, praise God. Only Jesus could do that. My family is different because of what the gospel did on the inside of me. But there came a point where I had to say enough is enough and I got to be sincere and I got to be right with where I'm at. And your, your behavior may not be nearly as bad as mine was that one night. But you know what? You got to be sincere about where you're at with the Lord. And get to a place where you say, you know what? I need help. And when you reach out for help, the Bible says if you... His hand is not too short to save. If you'll just reach out, he's going, come on, come on, draw near to me. Let's go, let's do life. But you know, as long as you stay in your deceit, in your deception, in your own spin of your own stuff, you know what? Before long, you'll get exposed. You know what's better? It's better to, for you to expose yourself before God than you to get exposed out in the open. Is there something that you would say tonight that you'd go, I don't want that to get out? I challenge you, students. Lay that out there before the Lord. You have small group leaders that love you and that care about you and that would love to pray and believe God for that thing to change. You think you can manage it, but it'll be out of control. Here's what Proverbs 28, 18 says. It's the last verse. It says, whoever walks in integrity will be delivered. Somebody say delivered. You know what that means? That means set free. That means free. Not just barely free, but delivered, like free. It says, but who is crooked in his ways will suddenly fall. It's the Bible talking to you. And my prayer is that you wouldn't fall, that you wouldn't suddenly fall, you wouldn't have to fall. But you would obediently before God come and go, God, I'm a mess. Man, I got a mess. Help me. You know what? He's quick to help. He's super quick to help. And you know what? You have leaders around here that want to help you. I don't know what your your deal is or what you're stuck in or what your mess looks like, but none of it's too big for Jesus. None of it. Every last bit of it, Jesus getting right in the middle of it, can right here. Whoever walks in integrity will be delivered. Be honest, be real, don't hide, and don't try to just manage your mess and push it into, some of us do this, you have a mess and so you shove it in the closet and shut the closet. And then what happens? Nikki shows up and opens your closet. It happens. And in, in, our, in our life, you know what happens? We go tuck it away in our hearts and we think it's all good. And then somewhere it gets exposed and it pops out. God's got better than that. Will you stand to your feet, man? Will you come to the front? I know it's a little bit heavier message. This isn't just, yeah, that's fun. Let's expose our issues. I recognize that. Hold on, students. Don't go running out of here. I want to pray for you. Then we're going to spend some time worshiping. You get it. Listen, one thing that worship does... As we, as we stand and sing, as maybe you sit and sing, as maybe you take whatever posture you take as you sing tonight, you know what, what worship does? Worship gives you an environment to get real before God. It's hard sitting right there next to your friend over here in a pack of a bunch of other people who might be distracting you, who might be talking, who might be doing whatever they're doing. It's hard to get real in that moment. But when we start, this, this music starts getting a little bit loud and you got an opportunity to you and Jesus get alone for a second, I challenge you to do that tonight. And if, if it means you need to sit in your seat and be still before God, do that. I don't care. But I, I know that God cares enough to go, hey, let's be sincere. Let's be real. Let's get into his presence. 
And the Bible says this, in his presence is the fullness of joy. Fullness of joy. It should be a blast to get into the presence of God. Let's pray. Jesus, thanks. Thanks for reminding us that, God, you want us sincere. God, you, even in our mess, you want to get us close to you. Lord, thanks that you don't leave us out there alone, orphaned, stuck. But even as Adam and Eve in the garden took a bite of some fruit, they were told not to. And then went and hid. Tried to shy away because they were ashamed and afraid. You pursued them. Thanks for pursuing us tonight, God. Thanks for getting into our stuff and cleaning us up and helping us to walk free. God, we want to be people of integrity that are delivered, as your word says. Help us to do that, God, as we worship you tonight. God, we want to set time aside, turn our affection towards you. And God, we choose to put our eyes and our attention in your direction. God, thanks for making a way where there doesn't seem a way. In Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. 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 Let's worship God.